Hi everyone, I'm Abigail, this is James, and welcome to another Two Kids interview. We are joined by Newberry Yonder author Susan Campbell Bartoletti. Some of Ms. Bartoletti's books include Black Potatoes, Kids on Strike, They Called Themselves the KKK, Untold History of the United States, Growing Up in Coal Country, How Women Won the Vote. Co wrote and edited the anthologies 1968 and 1789. And of course, the Newberry Honor book, Hitler Youth. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. It seems most people aren't happy with the direction of the world right now. You have an interesting perspective, having written about some horrible parts of human history. From your perspective, are things worse now, or is it always sort of like this? Okay. Well, I think that terrible times have always been with us. Uh, we can go back to the um, beginning of time and find uh, terrible events that have happened. So I think that's just, uh, it's a part of human nature and it's a part of uh, the world. And I can always, when I interview people, especially people of older generations, you know, they often say, oh my goodness, things are so bad right now. I think every generation uh, can talk about terrible things that have happened. But my perspective is this. I actually am a person who's very optimistic. Despite the fact that I like writing about terrible times, I get very interested in these things. And I also get very interested in people, especially young people who have tried to help and try to make things better. Uh, I like to shine a light on these terrible things, which is why I, I write about them, because I think when we shine a light on the dark times, it brings them out into the light. And then we know what we're up against. We know what we've got to do. We know what we have to do to, to move forward. That leads in well to our next question. How do you hope kids our age will use your book and decisions we will make when when we see things that don't seem right to us? All right. Well, I have a couple of ideas about that. Um, I think that one, kids your age are um, very much want, they don't like it when life isn't fair and they want to do something about it. And sometimes they can do something about it starting on their own. And sometimes they need the help of adults. I think that um, kids have a very strong sense of justice, that they know right from wrong. And that's why they want to do something about the things that they find are wrong. I also think that um, kids can practice every single day by standing up for what they know is right. It could be the small things. For instance, maybe you're at a store and and you use cash and maybe the, the, the salesperson gives you too much money back and you can say, hey, you know, this isn't right. I, um, you know, you gave me too much change. Or maybe you see, um, a bullying situation. And you know, that's not right. So every day, I think there is something that kids can see that isn't right, that's going on, and they can do something about it, whether they can do something about it themselves, or they can get an adult to help them. Life not being fair, we have interviewed a number of authors who've had books banned. Then in those places, kids don't have the same access to books that we have, and may not be able to see themselves represented in books. Can you give us your thoughts on this? Well, I have a book that is being challenged and that has been banned in many school districts across the United States. And first of all, it's not fair. Uh, for, I think kids deserve access to reading materials. Young people are citizens also. They may not have the right to vote yet. They may not be old enough to vote, but they are citizens. And as citizens, they're entitled to their First Amendment rights which includes the right to information and includes the right to read. And so that's um, part of my experience. My book is called, they call themselves the KKK. And that is the history of the very first uh, Ku Klux Klan group in our country, a group that was um, formed because of an idea called white supremacy. And it was a group that didn't think everybody should have the right to vote, especially people of color, and that they sh and they didn't believe that people of color, Black Americans, had um, the same rights that they had, that white people had. 
And so what we found is that after the Civil War, we had Black Americans who wanted the right to worship as they pleased and get an education, to go to school and to work and to earn a living. And there were groups of people, the Ku Klux Klan, who didn't think that everybody should have the the, the guarantees of our um, constitution and the promises of our own Declaration of Independence. And so this book is being banned um, across the United States in many schools. Honestly, book banning makes no sense. I'm so glad you feel that way. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. And there are some states now that yeah. are passing laws to forbid um, the banning of books. You think about it. These books are written by people with a strong interest in young people and education of young people. And they're especially written for young people so that young people can understand these big ideas. And as you already said, see themselves in uh, in stories. That's a very important part of learning when you can see yourself. And also write books themselves, too. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And they probably worked hard on those books like us. <laughs> uh, yeah, I worked really hard. Some people ask me, how long does it take to, to write a book? And uh, it takes me at least two years of research and writing. And sometimes like the, they call themselves the KKK or the Hitler Youth Book. It took me four years of research and writing. So if you're interested in being a writer, this isn't a good job for somebody who's in a hurry. Mm -hmm. When doing research for these, the nonfiction books you write, do the stories you learn about ever make you cry? Oh, I find it very hard. Um, there, I'm, it's, better, it's easier for me to read about terrible things than it is to watch them. Okay, so I'm able to read things better than, say, watch them on in a movie or watch them on TV. I think it's the visual that is becomes very hard. Um, but I do find the information very, very moving. And I think that's uh, an important part of the books that I write is to be able to emotionally and personally and intellectually connect with the subject. It was so hard for me to write, to research and to write, they call themselves the KKK, that I ended up joining an improv comedy group. And um, on one night a week on Thursday nights, I would join this class and, and learn all about improv comedy. And we had a good time and we would laugh. And then the next day, I'm back in my office reading and researching these very difficult times. What first made you want to write about really hard topics for kids around our age? Oh, wow, that's such a good question. Um, I, I believe strongly that writers need to personally and emotionally connect with the material that they choose to write about. I don't believe that every story is my story to tell. So the very first nonfiction book that I wrote was a book called Growing Up in Coal Country. And that was based on the experiences that my husband's grandfather had when he was an 11 and 12 year old boy who left school in order to work in the coal mines. And so um, some people would say, well, that's a pretty difficult subject. Children, you know, boys between the ages of seven and 16 working in coal mines for nine, 10 hours a day. Uh, six days a week. Um, but I also found that there were many instances of joy that these ch boys were able to find, whether it was um, teasing and having fun with their friends during, say, a lunch break, whether it was getting even with the boss they didn't like, or even sometimes going out on strike when they thought they were being treated unfairly. What is the most meaningful interaction you have had when talking to a student during a school visit? Oh, I love meeting readers. And I really it, love the questions that they ask. And I can't think, let me, I'm trying to think offhand of one particular, I've had so many. Um, sometimes uh, I have been to a school where, you know, I was an eighth grade English teacher for 18 years. And I've been to schools where afterward there would be a, a student who would come up to me and say, hey, you know, you had my mother in class when she was in eighth grade. And that was always meaningful. Um, and it's meaningful when children um, tell me how much they love my books, when they write to me and um, when they tell me what they've learned from reading some of the work that I do. 
You said that it can take two to four years to write a book. That's a huge commitment. When you get an idea for a book, how do you become sure that that is a story you want to tell? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, how is it a story that I know I want to tell? I trust my heart on it. I trust my instincts. And I also trust what I know about my readers. Um, and so it has to be a story that I think is extremely important and compelling enough so that I want to go in my office every day and work on it. But a lot of that just comes from um, the trust that I have and my interest. I'm a very curious person. I always ask a lot of questions and that helps me um, when I'm asking a lot of questions about a subject. I know that I want to spend time with it. What made you choose the years 1958 and 1789 for your anthologies and do you have any other year in mind for another one all right well i co-edited that anthology with mark aronson who is also very well known in the nonfiction world and it was really great working with him um first of all mark has this ability to think in terms of the big picture and i'm really good at the little details the minutia and so we we made this a really good team for working on this uh, we picked the year 1968 because when that book was published in um, 2018, yeah, 2018, it was the 50 year anniversary of 1968. And so um, that made it a good choice for a year. Plus, there was so much happening that year. You know, the Vietnam War and and um, the, dem the all the, um, the, the 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 rioting or what the problems at the Democratic Convention. And and so. And, the, and it wasn't just in the United States that all these things were happening, but it was around the world. It was like this volatile time around the world in many countries. And so that was our um, our idea was to make just not to show the year in our country, but to show what was happening around the world. And I wasn't going to write about the convention, but um, the person um, who I thought who whom we invi invited to write about it declined. And so I'm like, well, cool, I'll do it. Because um, I also love learning a lot, which is why um, I was very happy to choose that year. And it focuses on Abby Hoffman. And I also saw a lot of parallels between what was going on in, in 1968 and also what was going on politically in um, 2018. So um, that was a good match for me. Now, in the year um, 17, what is it, 1789 or 93? What year is it? 89. 89. 89. Yeah. Okay. It was the French Revolution, 1790. Oh, I keep getting those two years mixed up and I shouldn't because it's, you know, it's my book, but um, that was a year of revolution really around the world. And I was very interested in um, Elizabeth Vigée Le Brun, who was the favorite portrait artist uh, um, of Marie Antoinette. And so, and it has such a sad ending about Marie Antoinette. That's why I wanted to to write about her. Plus, I'm very interested in art. And do I have another year? Um, you know, Mark and I have talked about the possibility of another year. And I think if we did another year, it would probably be the year 1492. Um, you know, that was a, also another big year for what was going on globally. So another we'll year see. could be 2020, COVID. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yes. I mean, there are uh, so many things in uh, that year that you know, as a, I never saw it coming. And and yeah. I'll bring up my book, Terrible Typhoid Mary, because when I wrote that book, it was published in 2015. And that was about typhoid fever and all of the deaths that this um, terribly contagious disease was causing in our, our country. And, you know, not realizing five years later how many people would then be interested in reading about Terrible Typhoid Mary because of the the um, the, the correlation there. Rejection is a part of most writers' stories. Can you tell us about that part of your journey? Oh, okay, would you repeat that question, please? I didn't catch the beginning. Rejection is a part of most writers' oh. stories. <laughs> no Can wonder I didn't want to hear that part it. of your journey. <laughs> yes, um, rejection. Um, I started writing uh, when I was teaching eighth grade. And I actually thank my students um, for getting me interested because they were they had these amazing story ideas like the two of you as we were talking over a little break and they would write stories and poems and so i started to also write stories and poems one of the first discoveries that a writer has to make 
is finding her voice. And so I thank my eighth graders for helping me find my voice as a writer. Now, I sold my very first short story in 1989 or 1988, one of those years. But I've also gotten, you know, I have 20 some books published now, but I've also gotten a lot of rejections. And I don't keep the rejections. I know there are writers who keep every rejection and they'll have a stack of them um, that they look back on and say, look, I, I persevered. I don't keep them because um, I don't. I, I don't want to hang on to that part of the writing process. Um, and when I would get rejections in the beginning, um, a lot of times people would, some people would just give up and say it's not possible. But, you know, if you really, really, really want to do something and be something, you have to see what you can learn from a rejection. And so what I figured out is that I had to become a better writer. <laughs> you know, I wanted, I I, I couldn't just, cry over the rejections. I had to figure out how do I get better at this so that that no will turn into a yes. And then it did. It turned into a yes. Now I do have a couple of stories that have never sold. In fact, there's one story right now I've been working on for probably 10 years and I haven't sold it yet. But that yet word is really important. <laughs> yes, that's a long time. Yes, it is. So, our whole lifetime I know I was going to say probably I've been working on it before you were born <laughs> yeah well we're soon 11 so okay so maybe when you were one <laughs> yes it's exactly where you were and your reaction when you found out you were a Newberry honor author oh I love this story um because I found out on um the morning of January 23rd but let me tell you, I knew that if, if anything special was going to happen, it always happens with the phone call very early in the morning. And my husband um, was also a teacher and he was also a basketball coach. And so it was January. I live in Pennsylvania. The phone rang really early in the morning, like a little after five o'clock in the morning. And I'm like, oh. but it was the phone call that said there was a school delay because of snow. And I'm like, oh, darn. So then. A little while later, the phone rings again. And I'm like, oh, and it was the phone call that said, school is canceled today. I get it. I'm like, ah. So then the phone rang again. And I go, maybe. And it turned out it was his basketball players calling to ask if basketball was canceled. And so then it was after seven o'clock in the morning. And I knew by then probably all of the phone calls would have been made. And this is what I did. I went into my office because um, you can, might be able to see that I have a lot of books. Okay. And I started pulling the books off my shelf thinking, well, if I didn't win, who do I hope won? And so I buy a lot of books and I get books out of the library and I had a couple of favorite books there. And I'm like, oh, I hope this book won. And I hope this book won. And then lo and behold, the phone rang and it was for me. And it was about the Newberry honor. <laughs> That's a while. Yes. <laughs> you had to yes. wake up really early. <laughs> well, I still wake up early, but um, yeah. And that then, is you know, crazy. I'll also, I'll also remind you that there are those books, those there are years when you know your book has done really, really well with reviews and people are talking about it and the phone never rings. So that's a whole other kind of, can we call it a rejection? Probably not. It's not a rejection, but um. You know, it's what happens. I mean, it is a really nice word. Okay. That's a crazy story. <laughs> Can you tell us your thoughts and if you were concerned at all about artificial intelligence and its future impact on publishing? Uh, that's very scary for a lot of writers. It's actually infuriating. And um, I have joined a group of writers who are taking a stand. And I've written letters to the companies that have already scraped several of my books. Um, they want to use, you know, the books of writers who to in order to make their artificial intelligence chat box write better. And you know, I'm very interested in helping students and um and writers write better, but I'm not interested in helping a computer write better. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, there's a whole a lot of authors who are taking a stand against this. And there's an organization called the Authors Guild. And so we'll have, just have to see what, what becomes of all of this. There is a place 
for um, chatbots and research, there's a place for that, but it can't replace the creativity that comes out of the human mind. Yeah, so James, <laughs> remember, when you make your own book company, never use AI. I'm not. Right, that's going to be so annoying. That would take all the fun away from it, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'd rather come up with my own story. I Yeah, I'll bet you can. What, what writer has had the most influence on you? Oh, um, well, every book that I ever read influences me in some way. Uh, when I read a book, I look for the sentences that I want to stop and reread a couple times because they're so beautifully crafted. Um, but I will say that one of the um, most influential writers for me was a nonfiction author by the name of Jim Murphy. And he passed away maybe a year or two ago, but he was the first person when I went to this big writing conference, I listened to him talk about writing nonfiction. And then afterward, he was in a book signing and I talked to him again because I had this idea for a book that I wanted to write. And um, he encouraged me. And then it turned out that he was one of the writers that we included in that 1968 anthology. So that was like a really nice full circle moment where he was there at the very beginning of my career and encouraged me. And then he's there in that anthology at what be was becoming the end of his career, although we didn't know it at the time. Uh, we've had some authors that encouraged us too. Oh yeah? And tell me, can you tell me about that? Well, so I don't know if you've heard of this author. So my, we do author visits at my school as well. And there's this author named Keir Graf. And he's oh, okay. made up a lot of books. One with James Patterson, actually, which is pretty cool. So I've had this question telling, asking him, do you have any advice for me and my friends for starting this book company so we could make our own books? And he, he really liked the question. And he told me a really good advice to not stop, keep on going, keep on writing at your house, practice, like it's your homework. And it really encouraged me. And it makes me want to be a writer even more. Oh, I'm so glad. That encouragement is so important. Um, and can I add something to that piece of advice? Because I think that it's very important um, for people who want to be writers to do a variety of things. I call it side growth. OK, so if you want to be a writer, have interests in many different areas. I think. Music is really important um, for someone who wants to write, because I think when people can play an instrument or they like listening to music, that it helps them find the music in the story that they want to tell, in the words, in the sentences. Yeah, so there's like a lot of things that um, I also like to do. And I, I play the piano, like I know how to play the piano. I haven't been playing it recently, but uh, those are things that I think help inform, inform it. Um, many, many years ago, some years ago, I was talking to some kids who were in kindergarten. And one of the questions that they were really interested in, how do you make a book? And so for me, of course, you know, I, t I write it, I type it out, I, I print it out, and then I send it by email to my editor, right? But um, these kids thought that I was down in my basement making books. And they asked me, how do you make the pages stick together? <laughs> so. I thought that was a really funny question from a kindergarten kid. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell us about a project you are working on now? Um, yeah, I um I'm gosh, I'm I'm working on a couple different projects. I have an idea, I've been working on a picture book. Okay. I don't know if it's gonna sell, but I've been having a lot of fun um working on this picture book. It's called The Big Excuse. All right. Um and I, I'm not going to tell you what it's about because I'm still working on it. Uh, and then I just um, submitted um, a short screenplay, a short animated screenplay to a contest. And I got some really good feedback on that. And so I'm going to revise that and see what happens with it. Uh, I'm still working on that novel that I began when you were one year old. Okay. <laughs> I'm hoping that'll sell. And if it sells, then I'm going to let you guys know. You can break the news, okay? And I also have a nonfiction book about an artist that I've been working on. 
So. Finally, it's time for our Turbo 10. 10 rapid fire questions. Are you ready? I'm going to try. Number one. What's your favorite phrase to use? My favorite phrase to use? Well, these days, I've been saying a lot to myself, that was then, this is now. That was then, this is now. And that's actually the title of a book by S.E. Hinton. And, you know, sometimes, I don't know if this happens to you, but sometimes you can start thinking things like from long ago or like last year. And you can't do anything about it because that was last year, right? So I say to myself, that was then, this is now. That was then, this is now. Okay. Two, what is one subject you would love to learn more about? Oh, I would like to learn more about astronomy. I remember when I was in school, I <laughs> I loved having an astronomy class when I was at taking earth science when I was a student. Okay, so I would like to learn more about that. Go ahead. Number three, what is your go-to snack food? Snack food. I like anything with salt. Mm. Um, and so I often like, uh, we don't keep it in the house, okay? Because, you know, I'm like, <laughs> all right, potato chips, popcorn. Number four, what is what was your favorite book growing up? Oh, my favorite book growing up. <laughs> I was thinking about this book the other day. I loved the book, Harriet the Spy, because I loved how she was spy. And I loved how she kept the journal. And um, I am I have a bad habit of eavesdropping. And so that's kind of like Harriet the Spy. I don't know if it's a bad habit or not, because sometimes I get ideas. And I also um, keep a journal. And so I credit partly Harriet the Spy for that. Number five, if you could teleport somewhere right now, where would you go? If I could teleport? Yep. Um, well, I'd definitely go back to Scotland, but I've been wanting to get back to Paris. And so I think I would probably, let's see, it's November, Paris. No, I want to do that in the spring. I actually like this time of year. So because it's dark. And so I think I'll go back to the UK. Okay. Mm -hmm. Number six. If you could have one superpower, what would it be? To be able to write a really good book, the first draft that would sell. <laughs> Number seven. What was your favorite cartoon as a kid? Oh, my word. I loved um, Wile E. Coyote and the Roadrunner cartoons. I was I was a big cartoon fanatic, and I also loved all my comic books. I was a big comic book fanatic. There was always the Archie and Jughead and Veronica and Betty comic books. Um, I love comic books, and oh, we always make them. Yeah. They're awesome, yeah. Number eight, what is your favorite rainy day activity? A rainy day activity I like um, actually reading. Mm -hmm. Number Although, nine. Can I add to that? I'm trying to make myself yeah. go for a walk even if it rains. Okay, number nine. Number nine. If you could have any three dinner guests, who would they be? Three dinner guests? Do they have to be alive? Nope. No rules. Even a fictional okay. character. Oh, even a fictional character. All right. Well, my first thought is if they don't have to be alive, I would like to. Um, I wasn't lucky enough to ever know my father because he died when I was a baby. And so I would definitely want him at dinner okay and then I want my mom and she passed away last year so I would invite her to dinner and Very then fun. oh thank you and then um hmm, I want my dog Charlie back <laughs> he died two years ago <laughs> well this is the question we've all been waiting for number 10 what is the best piece of advice you were ever given the best piece of advice I was ever given um, well, uh, my mother told me when I was cooking, never like making a stew or something, never to cut anything so small that people wouldn't know what it was. Mm. You were so it has awesome. nothing to do with writing, right? <laughs> Here's my dog. Hello. You were <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for doing that. Oh, Thank I had so much fun. For spending this time with us. We can't wait to read your future books. Thank you. Thank you for this.